Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the April 2021 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook of a leaked document from Borders Books titled Union Awareness Training for Borders Managers. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this document is something I came across a number of years ago. It's been on the internet for a very long time. It was first published in 1999. The memo itself is from 1996. I think that this is a valuable document for anyone engaging in or even thinking about engaging in workplace organizing because it really gives you a detailed look inside the thought process of the management of a large corporation like Borders, Inc. that, you know, used to sell uh, books and movies and stuff like that. If you ever take a union organizing training, uh, I think that you'll find that the anti-union part of it uh, will match very closely what they say here. So it seems to me to be very authentic and... Um, Union organizing is really difficult. I would say it's most akin to espionage because you are really having to do a lot of sneaking around, especially in the beginning. You're trying to gather as much intel on the company as you can to know what you're up against and how to anticipate their responses and what you can extract from them. And then also sizing up, doing social maps of your workplace, identifying who you might Try to talk to first among your fellow employees, who's friends with who, who carpools with who, uh, you know, who openly complains about the job, who seems to suck up to the boss, who works next to each other. You know, just all that kind of stuff that you're going to need to know, because really what organizing a union is about is shifting the balance of power in the workplace away from the boss and towards the workers. The boss which would be the owners and their agents, managers, people like that, are people who can hire and fire. That's basically the power is they can cut off your access to the means of production. What strength the employees have is they're the ones who provide the labor. So no labor, no shop. <laughs> so you're trying to swing the balance of power away from capital towards labor. Easier said than done. I mean, really, Doing workplace organizing, it can take anywhere from months to years. I mean, I know campaigns people were working on for a year and a half before they went public. It's not something you whip up overnight. It's something that takes a lot of patience, a lot of skill, which is something you can practice and study. And just a lot of resources, you know, a lot of finding the right people and leveraging everyone's abilities in the best way possible at the right time. So, like I said, somewhat akin to espionage would be my take. For people good at that kind of thing, go for it, do it, it's great. Now, that kind of is a good segue into socialism and labor unions. Labor unions are not inherently socialist, necessarily. That is to say, trade unionists do not necessarily call for the end of capitalism. However, Marxists... Socialists, communists virtually always try to organize within them. Why? For my money, there are few experiences more class consciousness sharpening than engaging in a union, particularly at a place where the employers seem friendly, than engaging in this kind of activism. You, there are a few ways that will show you more quickly what the power dynamic is all about what the priorities are than saying to the boss, hey, we want more power. You will find out so quick that 90% of what is going on there is an illusion and a facade just to keep extracting the maximum amount of surplus value out of you. So I highly encourage anyone thinking about engaging in workplace organizing to try it. Understand, there's a decent chance you'll lose your job. Is it illegal? Yes. Organizing, there's a thing called protected concerted activity, which as long as you are organizing or making demands from your employer, not just on your own behalf, like I want to raise, but on behalf of at least one other person, like yourself and a coworker, that's considered protected concerted activity last I checked. 
which was pretty recently. Um, as long as you're doing that, you can't be fired for that, legally at least. Now, in many cases, the employer will fire you, and then you can go through a lengthy appeals process through the National Labor Relations Board in the United States, and many times people will get back pay, but you're going to have to find another job in the meantime because that can really take a while. Anyway, back to socialism and trade unions. So many trade unions just try to create a labor aristocracy. What is that? It's like a class of workers, employees, who are sort of elevated above the general proletarian population. I mean, basically a middle class. A lot of times it is for a favored race or a favored gender, <coughs> white male breadwinner, <laughs> excuse me. That, I mean, that pretty much is who they see as like the deserving workers. So really, labor unions that organize along those lines and historically have contributed to like the white male breadwinner labor aristocracy situation you know, they're buying into some very conservative notions uh, that are not socialistic in any sense whatsoever, and we absolutely need to reject those. But I mean, that said, unions are a hub for class consciousness raising just due to the nature of confronting an employer. Therefore, like I said, Marxist communists of any stripe should get involved in it. It's worth it. Now, the last note here before we get into the audiobook is labor unions haven't been doing so well. I don't know if you've noticed. To oversimplify somewhat, the first half of the 20th century up to about 1947 was much better for labor unions. You had much more militant unions, whether it's the IWW or the CIO to a lesser extent. I mean, big organizations that were engaging in powerful organizing and really were shifting the balance of power, becoming at least a strong fighting counterpower. Then comes 1947. What happened then? The Taft-Hartley Act. So the Republicans only controlled the U.S. Congress for one term, 1946 to 1948. In that time, they managed to pass the most significant piece of anti-union legislation, which basically took any really effective labor action and made it illegal. All kinds of things became illegal under Taft-Hartley, which had really been working to shift power to the working class. Again, without an empowered working class, you're not going to build socialism. It's much, much, much harder. So uh, Democratic President Harry Truman vetoed the bill, calling it a slave labor bill. And there were enough Republicans in Congress that they overturned the veto. To this day, that legislation stands. Bernie Sanders wanted to repeal parts of it. I say repeal the whole fucking thing. It's a monstrosity that never should have passed. And what were the effects of Taft-Hartley? Well, that's 1947. What we see then is in 1955, uh, due to that and the combined effect of the Red Scare, McCarthyism, where everybody you know, had to make the pledge of like, I am not and have never been a member of the Communist Party, etc. All the radicals were stripped out of civil society. So organizations like the CIO were, I mean, they purged all the radicals to the point where it was, and this is the time the Hollywood blacklists and all that kind of stuff, anyone speaking against capitalism in a major way was uh, purged from any position of influence or authority, more or less. So the CIO shrinks so much that it gets swallowed by the much more conservative AFL. The IWW in particular had done battle with the AFL many times, uh, calling them the AF of hell. Uh, the AFL would actually scab against the IWW during key strikes. Scabbing, of course, for those who don't know, is when you cross a picket line. There's workers engaged in an action against an employer. They're on strike. And scabs are the temporary workers who come in to replace them and keep the capitalist operations going. This is a bad thing. It could get <laughs> the shit beaten out of you back in the day. Okay, so Taft-Hartley plus McCarthyism ends up in uh, organizations like CIO get purged of radicals in 1955. So less than a decade later, the AFL swallows CIO and becomes what it is today, AFL-CIO. It was really less of a merger, though, than a swallowing. There just wasn't that much left of the CIO. And, of course, today, 
AFL-CIO, known to some as AFL-CIA, for a reason. They are very ineffective, and uh, maybe we'll do a video on the alleged intelligence and documented intelligence infiltration of, you know, what ostensibly is the leading labor federation in the United States and why it can't get really anything done. So there you have late 40s, Taft-Hartley and McCarthyism, 1955, CIO basically dies, gets swallowed by AFL. And then 1960, just 13 years later, the peak of private sector union membership. That's all it took. That's all it took. Union membership has been in decline for the last 61 years now. It's at really an all-time low since this entire process started. So, like I said, union politics are not inherently socialist, but they have long been a grounds for socialists to operate. The capitalists understood this, and they took very effective actions to push us out. So right now, you know, I've been thinking about these problems quite a bit, and I'm not sure that we're going to see some major resurgence of labor unions. It may be that we actually have to go to some other form of organizing that isn't so heavily regulated and then hope that we get the kind of socialist push through that that we need. So I guess I look at labor unions kind of like worker cooperatives. If there's one in your area, join it, organize in it. It's really better than just participating in a regular capitalist enterprise to make a living. But I'm not sure that this really is anymore, um, you know, much of a major vehicle for a mass movement or really something that in itself is going to be a major platform jumping off point for anything remotely approaching a revolutionary confrontation with capital, as you could say in the past was much more likely. I think that maybe, you know, we know electoralism is very limited, very regulated, sewn up tight. Labor unions basically are the same way. Historically, I mean, both of these were major avenues for socialism. So we may need to go to some other kind of community organizing that doesn't have, you know, all this kind of red tape around it. You know, capitalists want to keep us from organizing. So we may need to go to something else. But like I said, if there's a co-op, if there's a labor union, it's probably better to get involved in that than not. I just don't know that it has the same potential that it used to just because of the overall climate. All right. All of this said, let us finally get into the audiobook. Again, I think that this is a chilling look inside the calculating world of the corporate managers and their perspective on keeping us divided and disempowered so that they can bring, you know, they like to say, well, we, we like to deal with employees one on one. Well, the company isn't an individual. The company is sometimes billions of dollars worth of capital and teams of dozens, maybe hundreds of managers against one individual. They don't want this to be equal at all. They want to keep power very much skewed in their favor. So right off the bat, it's a very faulty, very prejudiced perspective. As with everything else involved with union busting, it's disgusting. All right, here we go. Audiobook time. Leaked document from Borders Books. Published here, 31-12-99. Title, Union Awareness Training for Borders Managers. Confidential Property of Borders, Inc. Prepared by Anne Kubek, Human Resources, September 1996. Borders' position on unions. Our management philosophy statement. Borders is committed to maintaining an employee relations climate which promotes maximum personal development and achievement. We are dedicated to treating our employees fairly and providing good working conditions, competitive wages and benefits, and above all, the respect that each employee deserves. We also believe in open and direct communication which permits the resolution of employee problems in an atmosphere of mutual trust, responsive to individual circumstances the company shall continue its efforts to enhance these objectives. We do not believe that our employees would benefit from outside intervention into these relations, 
but firmly believe that the best interests of our employees can be served without third-party interference, particularly a union. We greatly value our ability to work with employees individually without their being subjected to burdensome union costs, complicated rules, and costly work stoppages. We will vigorously strive to preserve an environment which nurtures the fulfillment of these goals. Union Activity at Borders Why is Borders experiencing so much union activity? Unions have made a major effort this year to try to organize many businesses, especially those in the service industry. Union membership has declined steadily in the last 10 years, especially due to downsizing and layoffs in the many industries. Comment, so this is late 90s, post-NAFTA, it's about five years after NAFTA. Unions were really struggling to keep up with the outsourcing. I will also add, right before 9-11, when the entire country switched to this militaristic, you know, nationalistic uh, unity philosophy under very right-wing leadership, the trade unions were actually having some large conferences that year and thinking about starting to stage a comeback. The whole war on terror and that entire change in the conversation completely poured like a giant bucket of ice water on that. Back to the text. Unions are businesses which survive solely on the dues of their members. In order to improve and stabilize their financial situation, unions need to increase the number of dues-paying members. Unions typically look at three things when deciding whether or not to target a company for a union drive. One, what types of employees do they have? Full-time or part-time? Educated? Will they have a philosophical bent towards unionization? Are they liberal or conservative? Two, is the company undergoing explosive growth? If so, there are likely to be problems within the organization associated with change in growth. The seeds of discontent may have been planted by the growth. 3. What is the makeup of the board of directors? Do these people run, own, work for companies that have unions, or do they support unions? Borders is a national corporation with a large pool of full-time employees who generally tend to be a little left of center. We are a very high-growth company which has undergone a great deal of change in the last two years. Change is unsettling. Some of our employees look to a union to try to control the changes in the company. Unions likely look at us as an important business to organize, one with great potential for them for years to come. Even companies with the most enlightened personnel policies will face problems with unionization. Summary of union activity to date. Actually, quick comment before I get into that. Most of the unions, as they said here, are looking for that dues money. They don't like to try to organize drives at small businesses that aren't going to result in a lot of dues for them. Um, you know, there are reasons why unions maintain paid staff. It is beneficial in many ways to have dedicated, you know, full time organizers who can work on research and strategy and, you know, just manage all the intelligence on companies that is required for union drives. That said, some unions uh, that are more on the like anarchistic side, for example, the IWW, they don't have paid staff. I think they have like a couple of officers way at the top who are paid, uh, but the entire rest of the union is run on a volunteer basis. So that is usually, but not always the case. Okay, back to the text. Summary of union activity to date. Philadelphia and the IWW. In February of 1996, a number of the employees of store number 21 in Center City, Philadelphia, signed union authorization cards and submitted a petition to the National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, in an attempt to unionize the store with the industrial workers of the world, IWW. The employees of the store had a variety of concerns which they hoped to address via unionization, including starting wages, raises, benefits, title-based considerations, control of co-op, store conditions, employee involvement in the decision-making process within the store. During a six-week campaign, Dave Stewart, general manager, and Ann Kubek, vice president of HR, met with the employees in small group meetings to discuss their concerns and inform them about union issues, collective bargaining, strikes, the IWW, borders positions on unions, etc., as well as to clear up some misunderstandings which the staff had, i.e. issues relating to inventory, how books are bought, 
RPLs, co-op, etc. The employees of the store voted not to be represented by the IWW in a 25 to 20 vote on March 27, 1996. They cannot attempt another union drive for one year from the election date. Quick comment there. Note that the date of that union election was March 27th, whereas the submission of the union A cards or authorization cards was February. So over a month, maybe, you know, up to two months. We don't know the February date. Why is that? Well, this gets to a reform called card check, which the Democratic Party has been talking about for years. Like Medicare for all, they dangle it as a carrot, but apparently never intend to deliver on it. What card check would mean is basically the way you start this process is you get a number of employees. I believe it's at least 30 percent of your proposed collective bargaining unit, like the people who would be in the union, a department, two departments, whatever. You get at least 30% of those people to sign A cards, and then you submit them to the NLRB. That is enough to show interest to trigger them to come in and hold a union election. Well, the idea behind card check is if you get 50% plus one, simple majority, that means that if you had the election that day, you know, signing the A cards, If you had the election that day, you would win. Well, that's not the case right now. You can submit a majority of the staff signing A cards. They'll still have the election. And it takes them like at least six weeks usually to to actually get the NLRB in there. Well, that gives six weeks minimum to the employer to terrorize the employees, fire union activists, all that kind of stuff. That's how you wind up with these situations. And in fact, most of the larger unions, rather than 30%, they try to get 70% A card signing prior to the election because they know they're going to lose like at least 15 to 20%. That period that the employers use is such a crucial time for them to come down on the activism and employee morale, and to basically scare people out of joining the union in exactly the way that they just described here. Card check would be, hey, we got 50% plus one of the employees to sign A cards, giving their authorization to the union to represent them. You're done. No elections, you're done. Democrats consistently fail to do this. And this is a major factor in why the U.S. labor movement is at like 7% right now, 7% in the private sector. That's fucking scary. All right, back to the text. Following the election, some members of the organizing committee seemed to have difficulty, God, it's so patronizing, seemed to have difficulty accepting the loss of the election and continued to try to encourage employees of other bookstores to organize. On June 15, 1996, An employee of store number 21 separated from the company for a performance-based issue. She issued a memo to the staff, which was not entirely factually correct, but she did indicate that she felt she was being separated for not being willing to follow store policy. At no point in this memo did she state that she felt she was separated for union activity. A few days later, members of the IWW started picketing border stores nationwide to protest her separation, claiming that it was tied to her role as a strong proponent of the union. This is false. She was separated for cause. She waited 45 days before filing an unfair labor charge with the NLRB. Comment. So this is always how they try to portray it because they could get in huge trouble for firing people for union activism. It happens all the time, but they always try to cover their ass. Back to the text. The IWW has distributed leaflets inside and outside of several stores, including Boston, San Francisco, Tosin, Louisiana, Portland, Oregon, Santa Monica, Chicago, Santa Barbara, Honolulu, Seattle, Madison, Novi, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, White Plains, Utica, Ann Arbor, and others. Additionally, members of the IWW have protested outside of Walden stores in Utah and New York City. Ann Arbor and the UFCW. In June of 1996, we learned that a number of employees at store number one in Ann Arbor, Michigan, had signed union authorization cards with the United Food and Commercial Workers, UFCW. 
We met with the employees in small group meetings to discuss the legal aspects of signing a union authorization card, the implications of unionization on the workplace, especially at borders, and the various staff concerns, benefits, wages, changes in the company. We also hosted an all-staff meeting to discuss the various issues. Rich Flanagan, president of Borders, and I attended this meeting to answer employee questions on wages, benefits, changes in the company, the latest employee handbook, etc. Quick comment, how often do you think that the president of Borders would come in to meet in small groups with the employees? It takes literally threatening a union to even get that kind of attention. This is what, I mean, like the person writing this has a blind spot too. They're like, oh, well, we tempted to address their concerns. It's like they don't have this power on a regular basis. <laughs> That's why people are, you know, against this whole system and interested in unions to begin with. Back to the text. The employees submitted signed union authorization cards to the NLRB on July 3rd, 1996. The election was set for August 14, 1996. So comment, again, that's six weeks later again, July 3rd to August 14. Plenty of time to scare and, you know, re-educate people out of being interested in the union. When the managers began talking with the staff at the store, it became apparent that at least some of the staff signed union authorization cards without truly understanding their significance. They were told by union organizers that signing the card was merely a request for more information. Some were told that they had to sign a card to vote. Others signed because they were frustrated with the company and wanted to make a statement, but did not necessarily want a union to represent them. We continued to meet with the employees of store number one to discuss the UFCW, their bylaws and constitution, duties and obligations of union membership, the finances of the UFCW, the effect of unionization on the store, collective bargaining, and the concerns raised by the staff. Elections are by secret ballot. The voting unit, the group of employees eligible to vote in the election, was defined in both Philadelphia and Ann Arbor as all the employees who were on the payroll when the petition was filed, except for the general manager and assistant managers. To win the election, the union would need to garner 50% plus one of the votes cast. There were 71 eligible voters in store number one. If everyone voted, 36 votes would win the election for either side. However, if only 34 employees chose to vote, then 18 votes would win the election. Regardless of how many employees vote, all employees would be represented by the union if the union were to win the election. On August 11, we held a final pre-election all-store meeting. There was no agenda or planned speeches. Attendance at the meeting was voluntary, and we had told the employees that everyone would have the chance to speak if they wanted to do so. We told them that this would be their chance to have their final say, regardless of their stance on the issue. About one half of the staff attended the meeting. Shortly after Joe Gable, general manager, opened the meeting, one of the union organizers stood up to read a statement. The statement articulated the four main reasons they had organized in the first place, because they felt they had no voice regarding wages, benefits, or working conditions, because their wages are too low, because the health care plan was changed, because the vacation benefit was changed. Comment, my guess is that the health care plan and vacation benefits changes were not increases. Just, well, safe, educated guess there, I think. It went on to accuse the company of conducting a, quote, scurrilous anti-union campaign designed to obfuscate the real issues, unquote. Comment, that's pretty typical, actually. They accused management of preferring to, quote, run the business as they see fit with a compliant, passive, and non-complaining workforce. These accusations are without merit. Comment, this person really, really, I don't know how they can write this with a straight face. That is such sheer bullshit. I can't... What company doesn't want that? That's fucking amazing. She would have the audacity to declare that they don't want a compliant, passive, and non-complaining workforce. What employer doesn't want that? Just fucking be honest. Okay, with this author's credibility thoroughly in the toilet, let's continue. They also complained about the fact that the employees posted, quote, anonymous and forged materials containing a diatribe against the union. This is in reference to one incident where an anti-union employee took a union document and rewrote it as a parody. 
Joe removed this from the break room shortly after it was posted. While it is unfortunate that this happened, this was not unlike the unsigned anonymous materials posted by pro-union factions. The Union Organizing Committee's perspective on this one incident is to say that it is, quote, indicative of the desperation that is driving anti-union forces at borders. Finally, the Union Organizing Committee stated that for all the above reasons, they had concluded that a, quote, fair, free, and informed election is not now possible, and that therefore they had decided to postpone the election by withdrawing the petition. Withdrawing the petition allows them to come back in six months and try to organize again, rather than waiting a full year if they had lost the election. They would need to gather enough cards again and submit another petition. At the meeting, the union organizers verbally indicated that they had withdrawn the petition because they had originally had the support of 70% of the staff, but now felt that they did not represent a clear majority and would not feel comfortable with a union in the store which only represented slightly more than half of the workforce at the store. This certainly seems disingenuous. Pop calling the kettle black there. If the union thought that they could have won this election, they never would have withdrawn the petition. Our last estimates indicated that we probably would have won the election two to one. Comment. How do you go from 70% in favor, submitting A cards, to two to one against... Tell me that this isn't a terror campaign. And you can see how vicious it is. You can hear how dishonest this author is. All the veiled hostility towards unions. This is how they really feel. Make absolutely no mistake. And it will become more pronounced as this document goes on. Resuming, they also stated that they felt that the organizing committee was too small and was unable to marshal the sorts of resources that the company had. I take issue with this statement. Oh, wow. Tell us about it. The UFCW is a large multi-million dollar business. Comment. Love how they just frame the unions as businesses. Like as if they don't believe in anything. Like they're not actually trying to improve people's lives. They're just a fucking business. That's a sick kind of slander. Unions actually are one of the best buffers against poverty you can have in capitalism. Organizing employee power has been documented, proven to actually improve people's lives in a way that capitalists never will. Borders is a large multi-million dollar business, which really had no interest other than just selling lots of commodities. The UFCW Literally, their business is helping to lift people out of poverty within the confines of capitalism. That's what they do. It's giving employees a voice. They would not have, period, without them. All right, or, or a similar union. The UFCW is a large multi-million dollar business which has employees whose sole job is to help employees organize. Lack of support by this union was not due to a lack of resources, but perhaps lack of effort on the part of the UFCW local in this case. That is disgusting. Every law is slanted in favor of borders. Every law. They have money coming out their ears as well. This is just adding insult to injury. You hear the viciousness, the nastiness. Maybe you guys just didn't try hard enough. Maybe the entire system is slanted towards you. We had the benefit of legal counsel, of course, as does the UFCW. And let me just say, this isn't an isolated case. I'm not just saying that it's slanted towards borders and like, you know, but it really could be either thing. You see, after these laws went into effect, unions across the board, not due to lack of effort, but because of structural prejudice, started getting obliterated. That's what's happening. That's what's been happening. And then here you have a corporation pretending it was like a fair fight and they just didn't try. Disgusting. Moving on. When the organizing committee announced their decision to cancel the election, there was a great deal of anger on the part of many of the employees present who were frustrated at having the opportunity to vote taken away without their consent. 
The union organizing committee had explained that one of the reasons that they had attempted to organize was because there was no democracy in the workplace. The other employees pointed out that by having a small group make the decision to withdraw the petition, they had removed democracy from the union drive. Comment. And I'm sure that that's really what this borders manager really just cares about. In fact, we know that that isn't what they care about. And here's why. Because the union election is held to, if the union wins, force management to deal with the union in good faith. Doesn't mean that they have to agree to anything that the union wants. It means that they have to come to the table, recognize the union, not deal with employees individually, but go through the union, and to bargain in good faith. There are legal precedents for what good faith means. It means that they have to try and they can't just basically, you know, deny the union and continue to try to deal with employees as if the union wasn't there. But the election is there really just to force the employer to do that. There's absolutely nothing stopping any company, Borders in this case, from voluntarily recognizing the union and, you know, therefore obviating the need for the election. So what Borders could have done, even with UFCW withdrawing the petition, they could have said, hey, we will right now conduct our own informal election, not through NLRB, but we'll conduct an informal election right here. If you want the union, raise your hand. If you don't, you know, well, raise your hand when we take the no tally. And they could have said, if we, in this informal vote, see that there is a majority, then we'll recognize your union, and we don't even need to bring NLRB into it. And then that would be on record, and then they would have to deal with the union. If they really gave half a shit about workplace democracy, that's what they would have done. They don't. So don't be fooled. Literally, when the issue of employee power comes up, corporations will use every kind of dishonest tactic imaginable. So be on your guard. I mean, Walmart, for God's sake, they'll close entire stores if there's a threat of unionization. (laughs) They literally fly in the anti-union lawyers on like a private express jet that day, and they have closed entire stores which should be illegal. I don't know how they get away with that because somehow making the threat that if employees or like you can't make threats as the employer, you know, you you can own a business for profit in like capitalist countries. However, there are some obligations that are enshrined in law. The, the bar is way too low on that. The floor is too low. But um, it, there is, you know, a set of obligations. One of them is, you know, you have to respect certain uh, employee organizing efforts. It's illegal to threaten employees with closing the store if they unionize. Somehow it's not illegal to just close it. All right. Anyway, moving on. At the end of the meeting, the employees were attempting to find some common ground and ways to move forward together to try to work with the company to address their issues and concerns comment. How do you think that turned out? They clearly wanted to find some way to put the divisiveness behind them and work toward regaining the cohesiveness that is characteristic of Borders staff. On an emotional level, there is relief and certainly some shock at going through a difficult situation without the decisive closure of the vote. Lincoln Park and the UFCW. On August 21st, We received notice from the UFCW demanding recognition without election in Lincoln Park, store number 101. We declined to recognize the union, and so the UFCW submitted their petition. The election will be held in October of 96. The base issues in this store appear to be wages and staff levels. This store is different in profile than the first two in that it has been open less than one year. Other stores. We have heard of various levels of interest in other stores, the IWW and the Teamsters in Indianapolis, number 16, UFCW in Albany, store number 35, rumblings of interest in San Francisco, number 57, and Michigan Ave, number 58. Employees have been approached by union organizers in Boston, number 120, Farmington, Connecticut, number 55, 
and Coconut Grove, number 121, and probably in other stores as well. Communication. What can be done to avoid unionization in my store? Comment. Notice the framing. From their point of view, having a union is always bad for the corporation. Always. It is something that must be avoided. Only there is no other policy. Ask yourself why. The best thing you can do as a manager to avoid unions in your store is the same thing we would expect you to be doing anyway. Manage a well-run store with open and honest communication taking place every day. Comment, you know, just like we have at most large corporations. If you are practicing good interactive communication techniques that encourage the regular exchange of ideas, concerns, and solutions between staff and managers, you will probably have the chance to address the types of concerns we've heard in union drives before they become flashpoints for a staff member or a union organizer looking to organize your staff. So much of what we've seen in the various union efforts is a lot of misinformation or lack of information on the part of the staff. Comment. Well, considering that three of the issues in the drive that they just profiled were low wages and benefits being decreased, probably not. I think that that was actually accurate information, and this is how they spin it. Continuing, in the absence of accurate information or any information at all, employees make up their own versions of the way things are or the way things should be. Again, sheer condescension. Continuing, However, even in a well-run store with excellent communication paths, you may still find yourself involved in a union drive. Why? Primarily because your store may have been targeted by a union. Oh no, you're targeted! You're a victim! You've fallen into the crosshairs of one of these evil union businesses. Oh my god. And a campaign will be mounted no matter how good a manager you are at the local level. In fact, we have repeatedly heard that local management is often not the issue. Corporate is the real target. It is clear that Borders has been targeted for unionization by the UFCW. Therefore, we must be prepared for the possibility of union drives in any store. As a manager, it is important that you take responsibility for the decisions you personally make and be honest with staff about them. Don't blame Borders, Inc. for decisions you make or decisions that make sense for your store even if they're not popular. Tell your staff the reasons behind decisions, whether they're made locally or centrally. Be prepared to wear your, quote, corporate hat when necessary. <laughs> Fucking tool. Be prepared to educate your staff each and every day about why things are the way they are. If you don't know, ask your regional. You all know the upside of hiring the best people in the business. The downside is that they're a demanding bunch. They need to know the why, sort of like you. When addressing the union issue, it is important that managers, general and assistant, are comfortable responding to questions in a positive, confident, and informed manner. The more comfortable managers are discussing unions and the potential negatives associated with them in our environment, comment not the positives, obviously, the more your employees will understand the bigger picture and be able to make an informed decision when faced with unionizing efforts by their co-workers or outsiders. You know, outsiders, because... Union organizers who work for a union don't know what it's like to be working class. They're just outsiders from these predatory union businesses, right? No. We should be open and honest with employees about what is going on with union efforts in our company, clear in our reasons why we don't believe that a union is a good thing for borders, consistent in our message, respectful of the legal rights of employees to organize, and assertive in our response to any union activity that we learn about in our stores. Comment, why don't you believe that a union is a good thing? They stated in the beginning that they're opposed to it and they want to deal with employees individually. So far, they have not said why. I don't know. Actually, it's been a while since I read this. I don't recall if they ever say why. I think that would involve a level of honesty that honestly would make them look bad because, like I said, there is nothing like a union drive to sharpen class consciousness when it comes to capitalist workplaces. You just see what the interests are so plainly and that the rest is really just bullshit window dressing. Continuing. Being open, communicative, and honest from the start can often eliminate the chance that employees will seek out a union or become involved if they are approached. 
Having the facts about unions up front can often be enough for employees to avoid involvement. Comment, why does this remind me of abstinence-only sex education? Just say no, employees. We need to be clear and articulate in our reasons why we don't believe that a union is a good thing for boarders. Our employees are intelligent, involved, and committed people. They also often feel overqualified and underpaid. In most cases, they are. (laughs) Okay. However, we must face certain economic realities as a business. Comment, you're operating over a hundred stores. Okay. If we can be clear with employees about the tangible benefits of working for boarders, beyond being one of the highest paying book, music, coffee retailers in America, we can help them to assess their feelings about their total compensation. We also need to be sure that our employees understand the difference in how boarders manages its stores, and that that difference is not something to be surrendered lightly. Surrendered. It is a war, folks. Many of our employees have never worked in another environment, retail or otherwise, and therefore have little to compare us to. Boy, it's all in your heads, folks. We must be consistent in our message, which can be difficult if you personally believe that unions are generally a good thing, or if you tend to feel sympathy towards the reasons behind unionizing in our environment. It is not inconsistent to explain that you may feel that unions serve a necessary and valuable role in society, but that they will not be compatible with our management style. Providing a consistent message that meshes with the general management principles of borders reiterates our desire for open and unhindered communication between us and our employees. Comment, they still have not given a single reason. Except for that, open and unhindered communication. They have not explained how a union would change that, though. We must be respectful of our employees' legal right to organize and to engage in discussions about their wages, benefits, and conditions of employment. Comment, and those are your legal rights. First and foremost, we want to be legal and ethical in our dealings with employees. If we do inadvertently violate any employee's rights, it will be our highest priority to recognize and resolve the situation as soon as possible. We do not seek to work outside the legal limits, but instead intend to remain union-free through legal and honest means. Comment. Yeah, I mean, the whole system is tilted towards them, so following legal means actually not that hard. This is why we prefer that any debate over the value of a union in our stores to take place openly. This allows us a chance to respond to false or erroneous information. If we cause employees to feel that they must hide their thoughts in order to protect themselves from potential retaliation, we all lose. Comment from the other side, as a union organizer, this is why you absolutely want to keep your campaign secret until you're ready to go public and you already have your core team of people who are in on the effort because they will try to terrorize and shut it down as soon as they become aware of it. We must be assertive in our response to any union activity that we encounter in our stores. Your natural reaction may be to hope that it goes away, or (laughs) act like it's a disease, or assume that only a small minority of people are interested in unions, but this is typically the wrong approach to take. Comment? Why? Because most people are interested in unions, and they only become not interested from employer propaganda and scare tactics. You in the audience listening to this as a union organizer or potential union organizer realize most people do want a union. This is why corporations like Borders are terrified of this effort taking place because it's so likely to succeed unless they intervene, quote, assertively. Continuing, our first goal should be to focus on the reasons behind the employee's dissatisfaction with Borders. Comment. Employees don't necessarily want to join unions just out of dissatisfaction with that particular company. That tends to be like the big drive. For example, when they introduced tailorization uh, back in the 20s, like when factories like really um, broke down work activity into small repetitive tasks that was very alienating and very dehumanizing to the workers, unionization efforts shot up dramatically. So, yes, employee dissatisfaction can contribute. However, some people just want more of a say in what's going on, which is not the default thing in any capitalist hierarchical enterprise. Just isn't. So, 
they look at it in terms solely of dissatisfaction or we're doing something wrong or we're being targeted. Some people just don't like the system. Continuing, there may be issues that can be easily addressed or cleared up if we are aware of them. Additionally, many employees have issues which frankly can't be helped by unions. Comment like what? If we can help them understand the scope and limitations of what a union can do for them, they may become less interested in a union. Often there's a lack of information or training that can easily be addressed. For instance, some employees feel that a union will help them gain control over the title base or co-op. These are areas that fall under management discretion, and we would not be required to bargain on these issues. Comment, okay, but if the union got strong enough, there would be progressive steps in that direction. So, dishonesty. Continuing, our second goal should be to raise awareness through education of what can be gained or lost. You can't lose anything by unionizing. Talking to employees about the costs of unionization or the duties and obligations of union membership can bring some perspective to the situation. For instance, if union dues are $22 per month, employees would need to negotiate, on average, a $0.13 cent raise just to break even on the union dues themselves before they even saw any difference in their take-home pay. If a union were able to negotiate a $0.25 cent raise for employees, they would get an additional $500 a year. 260 of that would go to union dues, leaving 240 for the employee before taxes. Okay, comment. A, that's still more money. B, you don't just gain wages. And first of all, do you know how easy it would be to get that kind of a raise? That's a tiny raise. That's very likely. Employees in unionized jobs are paid more on average in every field. So immediately the union dues do pay for themselves and then some plus you get all of the added protection. You get increased negotiations over your schedule, over other work conditions, over harassment from managers. You suddenly have a lot more strength. So this, and notice the way that they uh, frame that. 25 cent raise, well, a majority of it would go to union dues. Yeah, but a 26 cent raise wouldn't. So like, fuck you. Moving on. Raising awareness about the specific unions in question can also be enlightening. Anytime we are afraid to speak about unions, we give our employees the impression that there must be something of value to them in a union and therefore encourage their activity to continue. Comment, well, there is. <laughs> How should I communicate with my employees? Full staff meetings. You can bring up the union issue at a full staff meeting and talk about the challenges that the company faces. At such, I'm just, sorry. They were opening dozens of stores at this time. They were at their like peak at this time challenges. At such a meeting, you could make a statement about why you don't feel that a union is in the best interest of our employees. Okay, comment, but that's not your call to make. That's theirs. Explain our position on unions. Okay, again, not your call to make. And answer their questions or address their issues. If you decide to do this, please discuss the issues with your RD or an employee relations representative in HR first. Small group meetings. Small group meetings are often the most effective means of conveying your thoughts on the issue of unionization. There are not legal prohibitions against an employer speaking to groups of employees, even if this has not been a regular management practice. Employees may not be aware of Border's position on unions. Comment, would they care? They may not understand the facts. We must state our position clearly. <laughs> like it's a giant mystery. When you are questioned about issues that you are unclear on, you should not attempt to answer the question. Tell your employees that you will find out the answer and get back to them. Then make sure that you get back to them. One-on-one -on -one discussions. General managers and assistant managers should engage in discussions with employees to state their opinions and the company's position on unions. They should also offer to answer questions if the employee wants to ask them. Although you cannot ask questions of your employees, you can tell them what you think. You can also explain to employees that you are legally restricted from asking them questions. Comment, you cannot spy on union activity. But would be happy to listen to their thoughts or answer any questions that they may have. Comment, this is exactly like a cop. Here's what you say when a cop starts asking you questions in most cases. I do not talk to police. Am I free to go? I do not talk to police. Am I free to go? That's what you say. It's the exact same thing here. It's the exact same thing. They want you to start talking. They want to pick your brain. 
Don't let them. Early signs of union activity. Oh, here's where it starts getting really good. Recognizing the early signs of union activity. If you're an organizer, this is what they're looking for. One, employees who usually talk to management about their concerns and issues, no longer choosing to do so. Two, employees gathering in small groups of twos and threes and immediately halting their conversations when managers approach. Comment. In other words, managers are entitled to eavesdrop on every conversation. If employees are not letting you do this, be suspicious. Three, employees start gathering to talk in areas that are off the beaten path. Four, employees start spending more than their normal or allotted time on break and are often late getting back to work. Five, employees who are not normally seen talking to one another begin associating more regularly. <laughs> Quote, strange alliances begin to form. Six, employees start having regular meetings or bar nights without inviting managers. Because <laughs> we all know how much people love managers. Back office employees, trainers, or lead clerks. So a good general tip in a new workplace, don't become friends with these people because... They're going to notice if you ever change. And uh, it's just going to make organizing easier in the first place. I mean, don't, you know, declare yourself an enemy to them. You don't want to be on their radar in either direction, really. If you can hide in plain sight, great. But generally speaking, you're going to want to get in and do your organizing work as unobtrusively as possible without being noticed. Seven. The nature of employee complaints changes and the frequency increases. Eight, managers start getting an inordinate amount of critical and probing questions concerning policies and or benefits. Nine, the tone of discussion becomes more and more argumentative with frequent references to the company. Ten, group complaints start to surface. Employees approach management in groups or via petitions. The fucking terror. Can you even imagine? Being an employer, having a group of employees confront you on something, horrible. I mean, really, just the mind boggles. 11, a new leader emerges from the staff. 12, employees seem to be divided into two groups. Hostility may begin to surface between employees. 13, there may be a change in the rate of employee turnover. 14, new vocabulary may creep into, may creep into employees' conversations. Union terms such as seniority, grievance, bumping, job security. Job security is a union term now, etc. may appear in conversation. They want you to be suspicious as a manager of employees concerned about job security. That is how far this goes. Job posting, etc. may appear in conversations. Normal break time and lunchroom conversations may shift from the personal to talk of benefits, pay, job security, company direction. So in other words, it's normal for employees to talk about personal things. It is, quote, not normal for employees to talk about, you know, their actual treatment, benefits, pay, job security, and, and the direction of the company. So literally, they're saying, like, unions are this terrible thing. They also are insisting on a culture where it's suspicious for employees to be concerned with their collective treatment, benefits, pay, job security, and company direction. Literally, if you're discussing that with another employee, that is not what they want. So they're trying to create an artificial level of separation and you know, lack of fraternity among the employees. Like, that's the default. That's what they consider normal and acceptable. Like, anytime people, human beings, look at each other, generally, they wonder about the well-being of other people in other situations. In a capitalist business, that is suspicious. Think about that. Why would someone not want this system? I can think of one reason right there. 15. Items may be posted on bulletin boards or placed in employee mailboxes often not put in manager boxes, which discuss union news, information about union efforts in other border stores, information from the internet on the IWW, UFCW, or other unions. 
cartoons, and notes which take shots at the company or at the managers start appearing. How Unions Organize Unions will often approach employees to encourage them to seek representation. In many of our stores, the IWW has approached employees with flyers encouraging them to seek union representation. In some cases, our employees will seek out union organizers. In either case, employees will be encouraged to keep their activities a secret from their managers. Gee, I wonder why. Union organizers typically want to keep a very low profile until they get a majority of the staff to sign union authorization cards. By staying beneath management's radar on the union issue, they hope to keep managers from sharing information with staff that might dissuade them from signing a card, comment, almost like management and corporate has all the power to literally cut people off from earning a living, without which they will potentially starve and go homeless. Usually, a small group of employees will form a committee to organize the organization effort. They will be the key people involved in attempting to get their coworkers to sign union authorization cards and will probably be the first people to talk to your employees about the perceived benefits of unionization. Union Authorization Cards A union authorization card is a signed statement from an employee that he or she wants the union to be his or her bargaining agent for the purposes of collective bargaining with the company. The union authorization card is legally binding on the employee, despite any claims the union may make to the contrary. Union authorization cards legally authorize a union to represent an employee for the purposes of collective bargaining with an employer. There are three things a union can do with the cards which it collects. One, if the union gets cards signed by 30% of the employees in an appropriate voting unit, i.e. within a store, it can petition the NLRB for an election. Two, if the union gets cards signed by 50% of the employees in an appropriate voting unit, it may request that we directly recognize the union as the bargaining agent of our employees without an election. We would always choose to decline recognition because we prefer to allow our employees the opportunity to make an informed choice via secret ballot election. Comment, that's not why they do it. If we decline, the union could engage in a recognitional strike. Three, if the union gets cards signed by over 50% of the employees and we commit serious unfair labor practices. No, not serious unfair labor practices, just unfair labor practices. The union can ask the labor board to issue a bargaining order directing Borders, Inc. to recognize the union and bargain with the union without an election. Comment again. That's what you need to do now if you just have a majority of A cards. With card check, you wouldn't even have to deal with it. Again, Democrats, not a labor-friendly party. They won't even do card check. Also, how about the unions themselves? Are they lobbying aggressively for card check? This would be a major, major benefit to the entire working class, getting something like that passed, making it significantly easier to form a union. The amount of union efforts which start with high percentages of A cards and then get defeated is huge. The amount of new unions that would be formed because of card check would be enormous. You would see union numbers shoot up. Continuing. Thus, it is important to take seriously any word of card signing activity. If card signing can be halted before the union gets the 30% legally required, the union cannot file an election petition. Obviously, the likelihood of number three happening is very slim, but people should know the facts. Number two happens all the time. Borders always refuses to recognize the union without an election, however. Comment, again, gives them an extra six weeks to terrorize activists. And generally to misinform or at least mislead employees about unions. If employees want to get their cards back after they learn, quote, the facts, you should explain to them that they should write a letter to the union. The letter should state unambiguously that the employee no longer wishes to be represented by the union and wants their card returned. Employees can only request their cards back before the petition is filed. A manager may inform employees of their rights to revoke their cards without waiting until an employee has asked for this information. You may tell employees verbally or through a memo about how to revoke their cards, but you should not monitor the results of such information sharing. 
You may share with employees the addresses of the union and the NLRB, but you may not write letters for them to send. Union authorization cards may be significant for other reasons. A union may attempt to induce employees to sign union authorization in exchange for a waiver of the initiation fee if employees sign before the election. An employee may be told that signing a union card is simply a request for more information about the union or the process. False. Also comment, I don't know the stats on that. Any union would know that's an unfair labor practice. You can't do that. An employee may be told that he or she must sign a card in order to vote in the election. False. Again, I'm not sure how often that actually happens. Union organizers may tell employees that a majority of their co-workers have already signed cards, regardless of the veracity of that statement, to encourage employees to sign a card. Signing a union authorization card is like giving the union a blank check to negotiate on behalf of the employee. Comment. Um, Even if that were true, that's not entirely a bad thing because the union is going to be applying proven techniques for getting you better conditions. Why anyone would not want that is somewhat of a mystery to me, but it's not even true. Unions involve workers in what they're doing. The union people know that the more employees are involved, the stronger the union is. Now, there are corrupt unions that run really shitty operations. By and large, though, most union activists are dedicated people who are leftists and really believe in workplace democracy. They want people to be involved as much as possible. Although, yes, again, there are varying levels of commitment to that between unions. All of them, though, are going to do something to get better conditions. So, you know, they're implying here that somehow you would get better conditions without a union. That's nonsense utter nonsense. Continuing, unions can call a strike for recognition. An employee who has signed a union authorization card is then compelled to go out on strike, even if he or she has changed her mind about the union. Let me just make a general comment. This is the end of that section. Let me make a general comment here about the state of fragmentation in the United States. A lot of like what that last statement, I'll read it again. An employee who has signed a union authorization card is then compelled to go out on strike, even if he or she has changed their mind about the union. I think implicit in that is like what they're playing off of is people's just terror about engaging in collective action. We are so used to and socialized into just thinking it's normal to do everything as an isolated individual without really any, you know, cooperating with anyone else or coordinating with anyone else. And like this idea of collective action, it can be scary for people who are brand new to it. People who know the strength of numbers are less scared by it, if if at all. But they're basically playing off of the general state of things. People are afraid of other people. Workers are afraid of other workers because we've been socialized to think that way. That's what they're playing off of here. And it's just really despicable because they're just profiting off of social problems and creating social problems for profit. Moving on. Unions. We have primarily dealt with two unions thus far, the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, and the United Food and Commercial Workers, UFCW. Industrial Workers of the World, IWW. The IWW is the union we first faced in Philadelphia. They're a small union, less than a thousand members nationwide, and are more of a political organization than a practical union. Comment, the IWW really is both, although in my opinion, they're kind of too small to do either effectively currently, although I understand that they've been growing, you know, in the last 10 years as many left, far left things have been growing, just like this channel. Um, They were founded in 1905. If you're interested in this subject, I have some Eugene Debs audiobooks uh, speeches up on the channel. Go check those out. He talks about basically the IWW started as the merging of several existing labor unions, large and small, into what they conceived of as one big union of all the workers that would organize for day to day improvements, you know, kind of thing. Lenin called trade union consciousness, better benefits, etc. But they didn't stop at economism. They did that 
And then they also were organizing to end capitalism, which I guess they would call political organizing per this document. Um, at, so the IWW suffered in two major ways. One was government repression, that they really cracked down on them. The other was internal splits. There were a number of internal splits, which kept having the IWW's power, it's very much contrary to the idea of one big union. Around 1960, the organization nearly ceased to exist entirely. Since that time, they have built back somewhat and are very anarchist in their orientation. They, uh, if you're Marxist really in any way, um, you may not get along so well with IWW folks. Um, again, just very, very strong anarchist inclinations, at least the last time that I checked. So that's a little bit of my note on the IWW. They do engage in organizing campaigns. Uh, to my knowledge, they haven't embarked on anything as large as borders in recent years, although they did um, organize at some fast food chains, and they're always doing some kind of like small workplace organizing, as well as you know telling people to read the bread book and stuff like that. Okay, back to the text. They have attempted to organize our employees in several locations, as well as being the primary force behind the campaign to leaflet our stores to protest the separation of Miriam Freed. The IWW, also known as the Wobblies, was founded in 1905. The IWW refers to itself as one big union. They are committed to building a, quote, strong militant union in their own words. They are headquartered in Ypsilanti, Michigan, with offices in San Francisco, New York City, and Philadelphia. Fred Chase, IWW General Secretary, says, quote, If you have a sort of leftist, progressive political outlook and feel a need to be part of a union, the WABs are it, unquote. Another member stated the IWW belief that, quote, There should be an abundance for workers and nothing for the parasites, the parasites being the bosses, those who dictate the conditions of our labor and our lives, unquote. Comment, I love old IWW literature. To me, it is like some of the most American phrased Marxist sentiment ever put out there. Uh, I love especially like pre-World War II wobbly stuff. There's a lot of good stuff from that time. Not all of it, but there's a lot of good stuff. They have a long history, including the Colorado Miners and Big Bill Haywood in 1905, Joe Hill, and the Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts. The IWW of today encourages direct action, which is defined in A Worker's Guide to Direct Action as, quote, any action taken in the workplace which cripples the boss's profit-making and forces the company to give in to the worker's demands, unquote. Preamble to the IWW Constitution, quote, they just put the whole thing here, the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as hunger and want are found among millions of the working people and the few who make up the employing class have all the good things of life. Between these two classes, a struggle must go on until the workers of the world organize as a class, take possession of the means of production, abolish the wage system, and live in harmony with the earth. We find that the centering of the management of industries into fewer and fewer hands makes the trade unions unable to cope with the ever-growing power of the employing class. The trade unions foster a state of affairs which allows one set of workers to be pitted against another set of workers in the same industry, thereby helping defeat one another in wage wars. Moreover, the trade unions aid the employing class to mislead the workers into the belief that the working class have interests in common with their employers. These conditions can be changed and the interests of the working class upheld only by an organization formed in such a way that all members in any one industry, or in all industries if necessary, cease work whenever a strike or lockout is on in any department thereof, thus making an injury to one an injury to all. Instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, we must inscribe on our banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wage system. It is the historic mission of the working class to do away with capitalism. And un unquote there from the preamble to the IWW Constitution. 
Uh, I love that they put that in this document. Uh, no arguments here. A couple of quick comments working backwards where they say instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, rather they suggest abolition of the wage system. What the IWW is doing is contrasting the AFL, whose motto was fair day's wage for a fair day's work, with which I mean, which really upholds capitalism and that whole system. They say, nah, let's abolish the wage system. Like, fuck the whole like profit and wage system. Let's do away with capitalism. Also, one other comment, when they talk about the trade unions being unable to cope with the consolidation of industry into fewer and fewer hands. This was the emergence of industrial unionism versus trade unionism. The previous unions were organized along trade lines. So all the plumbers were in one union, all of the railroad workers, engineers, whatever, were in one union, etc. And what they found was that this actually wasn't working. Again, see the Eugene Debs speeches because he talks about this specifically. What the IWW tried to do is get all the workers everywhere uh, into the same union so that if there was ever a lockout, they would shut down the entire economy and thereby get leverage over the capitalist class. When I opened this discussion talking about Taft-Hartley, one of the things that they made illegal was basically a lot of these tactics of industrial unionism because it fucking worked. So a lot of what the IWW was founded on, and I believe that this did contribute to the decimation and virtual dissolution of the union, which kind of has reemerged as just sort of like an anarchist ideological clique, is that they uh, all of their tactics got, you know, outlawed, basically. So this is that post-World War II ascendance of the U.S. as like capitalist god, you know, the new god of imperialism, and trying to have, uh, you know, wild, plays-by-its-own-rules kind of union like the IWW. The U.S. finally had the power to deal it more or less a fatal blow. May we all recover soon as the U.S. now is strongly in a descending state of power. All right, continuing with the document. United Food and Commercial Workers, UFCW, part of AFL-CIO, or AFL-CIA. The UFCW is the union which we are primarily dealing with at this point. They attempted to organize store number one and are trying to organize store number 101. In addition, they appear to have targeted other stores and the Harrisburg warehouse in an effort to get them to organize. The UFCW is primarily the merger of two former unions, the Retail Clerks International Union and the Amalgamated Meat Cutters and Butcher Workmen. The UFCW has more than 1.4 million members nationwide. The UFCW primarily represents employees in supermarkets, hardware stores, warehouses, department stores, and other service and retail industries. The UFCW is a big business. The International Union has 52 vice presidents alone, most paid more than 100000 a year. The president makes over $250,000 a year. These salaries come solely from union member dues. The UFCW... Comment. I love how they can try to grandstand on this issue. That's fucking amazing. How much does the Borders CEO get? How many vice presidents does Borders have or other upper-level administrators? How many do they have? And wh- where do those salaries come from? I believe they come solely from customer payments. Like, fuck you. You know, and very much unlike you, they're actually directly trying to improve people's lives and empower them. I guess books do that to some level, but we should really just decommodify books and distribute them on a completely different basis. But that wouldn't be in your interest, now would it? Moving on, the UFCW employs individuals known as business representatives who work with employees as well as investigate contract violations, grievances, and police the contract. They also, quote, audit employers' records to ensure that new employees have applied for union membership. Additionally, they utilize a union steward who can be elected by the employees or appointed by the business representative. Preamble to the UFCW Constitution Because the history of workers has been but the record of constant struggle against oppression by the wealthy and powerful, and because wealth, with its accompanying power, 
is becoming more and more concentrated in the hands of the few, and because the organization of workers into trade unions is essential to the economic, social, and political freedom of society and to the successful functioning of a democracy, and because in union there is strength and workers are better able collectively to secure their fair share of the profits accruing from their toil, the international union is created in order to elevate the social and economic status of workers and further to advance the principles and practice of freedom and democracy for all. That's the end of the preamble to the UFCW Constitution. You can hear the clear differences. I mean, the IWW is calling for the abolition of capitalism, whereas the UFCW is just calling for, like, protecting freedom and democracy within capitalism. Either way, they recognize large power imbalances, which their union is aiming to correct, both in the, you know, short and long term as far as the IWW, and at least, you know, in the short term as far as the UFCW. I wonder, by the way, um, what borders, you know, political orientation, if this uh, HR representative was pressed on the content of these, uh, well, I think we know how that would turn out. It would be like any corporation. By law, they're mandated to deliver maximal returns to the shareholders. They are under legal mandate to do that. They don't stand for anything else. They legally cannot stand for anything else that gets in the way of delivering maximum return to the investors. That's what they stand for. So fuck you with like this whole unions are just another business bullshit. That's exactly what it is. Moving on. The employer's response. In several cases, the first interaction our employees have had with union organizers has been when various stores have been leafleted by members of the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, protesting the separation of Miriam Freed. The IWW has actively targeted our stores for protest and have approached our employees with leaflets, which encourage them to organize. It's important that managers know how to respond when this happens. So that'll be good. How to respond to leafleting in your store. The management contained on the IWW leaflets is misleading and in many cases erroneous. The language is inflammatory, encouraging employees to unionize and customers to boycott borders. Yeah. We have limited ability to stop these actions because of free speech rights. Shucks. We can prevent the leafleters from blocking public access to our stores. If any leafleters block access to your doors, you should contact security or the local police department. In some cases, you can move them to the edge of the lease line. They are not allowed to leaflet in our stores, and if they attempt to do so, you should ask them to leave the store. You can call the police or security to have them removed from the store. Mass picketing by groups of individuals who obstruct free public access to the premises can be controlled by a court order specifying the maximum number of pickets and the distance from the door which they must maintain. In most cases, we have not been picketed by a large enough group or often enough to make a court order necessary or feasible. Additionally, court orders tend to only draw more attention to the pickets. Acts of violence, name-calling, threats, and other such intimidation can also be controlled by a court order. Contact Ann Kubek, VP of HR, or Vin Altruda, Senior VP of Retail Operations, before pursuing such action, however. In most cases, asking them to maintain clear access for our customers is sufficient. If they do not maintain clear access, you can call security or the police to clear the entrance. Quick comment. You know what HR stands for? Human resources. Do you know what that means? It means resources which are human to the corporation. Corporate resources which are human. You are a resource to them, nothing else. You are a resource for making profit. That's it. That's why they're there, and you're there so that they can employ you as a resource of the human variety. That is how they see you. You need a union. Moving on. Regardless of whether or not your store is leafleted by the IWW, you should be prepared to discuss the union situation with your staff. It is important that when you do so, you follow company policies, legal guidelines, and common sense. Don't be afraid to address the situation, however. Managers have rights in this process, too. The manager's role in maintaining a fair and legal environment. Employees' rights, management's rights. It is important to remember that, at all times, you represent the company to the employees who work for you directly. 
They will take your words and actions as the view of Borders, Inc. Borders will be legally responsible for your actions, regardless of whether they have been authorized or not. It is important that you not engage in activity, which may be considered interference in employees' rights to freely choose or reject a union. Employees have legally protected rights under the National Labor Relations Act, or NLRA. These rights include the right to discuss wages, benefits, and terms and conditions of employment. Employees have the right to engage in solicitation of other employees as long as they do not solicit during working time or time when an employee is required to perform job duties. Thus, employees can engage in such discussions or solicitations on breaks or during non-working hours. Quick comment. So, we're dealing here with an environment where you're literally not even allowed to talk to other workers about improving conditions while the capitalist, you know, has you on the leash under the stranglehold of, I mean, their, you know, their control over the workplace. Why wouldn't you want a union? Anyway, moving on. The NLRB holds that retail stores can limit their employees from engaging in union activity in the store's customer areas. Thus, we can limit their discussions to non-working time, and we can limit such discussions to take place in the break room or outside of the store. Customer areas include the sales floor, customer elevators, escalators, stairways, and corridors. The law states that employers cannot terminate an employee for engaging in union activity. Borders has and will continue to adhere to all state and federal laws which protect employees' rights. An employee who believes that there has been a violation of the law can file a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board and LRB. Prior to separating any employee from the company, you must contact one of the employee relations representatives in the Human Resources Department. Comment, I will probably do a video on protected concerted activity and some case examples because this is key. And this is what they're talking about here. Continuing, unions often invite companies to interfere. What? Unions often invite companies to interfere in unionizing activity in a variety of ways. Using union organizers from within to lead managers into inappropriate actions or statements. Why am I reminded here of like when pedophiles claim that the child seduced them? That's fucking amazing. They can cause managers to unwittingly commit unfair labor practices. Those poor managers who I'm sure under no other circumstances would be attempting to bully, harass, intimidate, or spy on their employees. Those dastardly union people, just what are they thinking? They may then attempt to use this unfair labor practice to have the NLRB declare an election to be void if they lose, what sore fucking losers they are, or to appear as the hero and champion of workers' rights. Comment, which in fact they are. What are you saying, that Borders is the hero and champion of workers' rights? Go fuck yourself. Unions appeal not only to those who make low wages. Comment, why are you paying them low wages? But also to those with good wages and benefits whose employment is not covered by a contract. Comment, why don't you offer them one? Often, employee dissatisfaction can be traced not to wages or benefits, but to their feelings about how the company or the management team treats them. Union interest can grow if employees feel that they are not being treated fairly or with respect. Comment, it's amazing this needs to be spelled out for anyone, for any human being. How can your brain be this broken that you need this explained to you? Union interest can grow if employees feel that they are not being treated fairly or with respect. Also, some employees simply believe that they should have a contract to guarantee their benefits and protect themselves from the company. Some employees believe that unionization is desirable in the workplace, regardless of working conditions. Comment, yes, that's absolutely true. Otherwise, you can show up at any time and be told you can't work there anymore. The basic rule of conduct for managers is to maintain normal day-to-day -day relations with your employees. You should never use threatening or intimidating tactics or in any way deviate from normal enforcement of company or store policy. Additionally, you should continue to try to involve employees in problem solving at the store level and seek their input on store or company policies and procedures. The key is to really listen to their concerns and suggestions. Comment, this is always illusion and sleight of hand. Why? Because your input is never binding. It is always non-binding. This is why collective bargaining is important, and generally why we're fighting for socialism. 
We want a system where industry workplaces do not hang on the whims of capitalists, investors, and their managers. That's not what we want. We want a system where the people who do the work control the work. While we may not ever have absolutely direct democracy on everything, we could have a much, much, much more democratic system than the one we have. Unions, even within capitalism, are a step towards that. And again, historically, a basis for socialist organizing. When Lenin said all power to the Soviets, it was an attempt to turn over power to the existing kinds of worker collectives that were existing. Taking state power, that's important. You need to keep the capitalists out of state power. State's a powerful instrument. But you do also need democratic grassroots organizations, or it's like having a heart and no arteries, let alone capillaries. So, moving on. If you're faced with a situation where one of your managers encourages employees to join a union, you should immediately call one of the employee relations representatives to discuss this. A manager is an agent of the employer. Listen again. A manager is an agent of the employer. To everyone out there, probably most of you don't need to be told this. Don't be friends with your managers. And as such, can bind the company by his or her actions and statements. To an employee, support on the part of a manager can be interpreted as employer support, which violates Section 8A2 of the National Labor Relations Act which makes it an unfair labor practice for an employer to, quote, dominate or interfere with the formation or administration of any labor organization or contribute financial or other support to it. Interesting. We'll comment on that in a second. A manager engaging in such activity should be instructed to cease such behavior immediately. So they raise an interesting topic here. Something that sometimes happens in union organizing situations is that there will be more than one union uh, up for consideration by the employees. So when you have the election, you're actually like voting between different candidates as like your agent, uh, you know, voting between different unions to represent you in collective bargaining. So, you know, if it looks like the employer is supporting one over the other, that could be a problem. Also, I think the actual intent behind an employer not being allowed to dominate or interfere with the formation of administration of any labor organization or constitute financial or other support to it is to prevent corruption of the labor union by the employer. I mean, there's other problems like, you know, the whole dues system that, you know, I mean, that basically does give the union a material stake in the continued existence of the business. That's really more of a concern for communists than for employers, though. Um, so anyway, I mean, I think they're trying to dot their I's and cross their T's there, but, um, anyway, just to you workers and organizers listening, even if the manager seems to be your friend, they're not just reminding you because sometimes in the situation, you know, you can let your guard down. Anyway, moving on. The union may ask you for an opportunity to discuss alleged complaints regarding employee grievances. You are not required to comply with the union's request until and unless it becomes the designated representatives of the employees. Until the union is recognized voluntarily or designated by the NLRB as the employee's representative, the employer is not required to bargain with the union on any subject. If a union representative contacts you directly, do not look at any list of employees that a union rep attempts to give you. Do not look at any cards or letters with names on them. Do not look at any papers that they attempt to hand you. Refer any phone call, letter, or personal visit by a union representative to Ann Kubek, Vice President of Human Resources, or in her absence, to Jim Lathrop, Director of Employee Relations. If the union representative refuses to leave your premises, ask them to leave, then contact security or the police to have them removed from your premises. If you cannot get them to leave the store, move to a more private area, away from customers and staff, and make sure that there are at least two representatives from management present during any discussion. Get the name and affiliation of the union representative, their business card if possible. Ask them to state their business. 
If he or she indicates that his or her union represents a majority of your employees, you should immediately state that you do not believe the union represents a majority of the employees. <laughs> Comment, no matter what you actually believe. If the union representative produces a stack of union authorization cards, do not accept them or look at them. If the union representative attempts to hand them to you, refuse to accept them. If there is not a witness present, call one immediately to witness the refusal. If you look at the cards, the union may try to claim that you have accepted them. Accepting cards may, in some circumstances, result in the loss of our right to gain a secret ballot election. Note the language there, to gain a secret ballot election. They view it as their gain. Make no mistake about that. That process is there to skew the process towards the corporation, company, however it's formed. It can be used to claim recognition, since you now know who has signed cards and therefore theoretically supports the union. Theoretically. It may cause the NLRB to order us to bargain directly with the union without an election. Frequently, Unions will ask for a list of names and addresses of employees. Sometimes they will ask for information about salaries or benefits. Do not provide union representatives, including those who may work for borders, with this information. General managers should not post employee address lists in the store, as employees will often turn these over to union organizers in order to mail things to employees directly. Can we keep the union off our premises? Yes. It is company policy to limit access to the premises to employees, customers, and vendors. I guess that's a note to union organizers. Do this while you're shopping. Trespassers are not permitted and can be prosecuted. Non-employee union representatives are not authorized to conduct their business on our premises. Should such outsiders refuse to <laughs> remove themselves, immediate action should be taken. A manager should escort the individual off the premises. Call security or the police if you need assistance. If possible, however, avoid having the union representative arrested. Your main concern is simply to remove them from the premises. Managers, as representatives of the company, may and should express their opinions and make statements regarding unions in general and the particular union specifically, provided they do not threaten employees in regards to union membership or activity. Additionally, you may not reward anti-union activists. Employees cannot be asked about their sympathies, activities, or involvement in the union. Employees may not be disciplined for engaging in union activity. Employees may be disciplined for violating store or company policies and procedures consistent with your regular performance discussions regardless of union affiliation. It is important that you discipline your employees consistently and without regard to union or company sympathies. Rules of conduct for all employees should be clearly and consistently communicated and enforced. We strongly recommend that during an organizing campaign or in the face of union activity, you contact the Employee Relations Department prior to enforcing any formal disciplinary action on any employee. Uh, this continues for a while. I just want to say, clearly, they know their rights. Do you know yours? Moving on. Do's and don'ts. There are some basic and easy rules about what managers can and cannot do in terms of protecting the rights of employees. You can remember this with the easy acronym of SPIT. Managers cannot spit. Here's what you can't do. SPY. Managers cannot spy on employees' union activity. PROMISE. Managers cannot promise benefits to employees who vote against the union. INTERROGATE. Managers cannot ask questions of their employees about unions. THREATEN. Managers cannot threaten employees who engage in union activity. So you can see that what you can't do is pretty simple, and three out of the four things you can't do, you wouldn't do anyway. The only one you can't do that's hard is the part about asking questions, since it's a normal means of interaction with our employees. However, you can tell them that you can't ask questions, but that you're willing to listen if they want to talk about it, and are able to answer questions if they have them. There is an easy way to remember what you can do as well. Managers can be a foe. Here's what you can and should do. Facts. Managers can give facts about unions. Okay. How many of the facts are true? We've already looked at some very skewed facts given in this document. Opinion. Managers can give their personal opinions about unions. And examples. Managers can give real-life personal examples about experience with unions. So you can see that the range of what you can do is huge. 
and the list of what you can't do is really pretty small. What can and should managers do? 1. Keep union organizers from soliciting on the store premises. 2. Clearly articulate the positive benefits, tangible and intangible. Intangible being ones they don't have to pay for. That our employees currently enjoy, including higher rate of pay than other retailers, better than national average raises, positive work environment, opportunities for promotion, etc. 3. Make sure that your employees understand the significance of signing a union authorization card and realize that they do not need to sign a card in order to vote in an election. Comment. That's hugely misleading because, depending on how things go, if they want to vote in the election, but people don't sign enough A cards, there's not going to be an election. So it's potentially very misleading. If they want to vote against the union, then yeah, they shouldn't sign the A card. But just saying that you don't need to sign a card in order to vote in an election, technically true, but if nobody signs cards, there won't be one. Four, be clear with employees about the potential negatives associated with union membership, including potential strikes, dues, fines, loss of flexible open environment. Yeah, I really want to lose the opportunity to be pushed around on an individual basis by my boss, etc. So you can see there, you know, when they talk about their ability, it's really to be manipulative. I mean, none of those things are really downsides. They all result in more power to the employees, which is like the thing they're trying to prevent people from realizing. And they have to be misleading because it's an objective fact that this would result in more power. Number five, talk with employees about how you would prefer to deal directly with them rather than a third party. Okay, except they have an entire team of lawyers, managers, HR people, and the employee has nobody. Okay. So again, misleading. They're leaving out, they're omitting a huge amount of information there. Six, tell employees why you don't believe that a union would be a good thing in our environment. Not their environment, our environment. Seven, share your own personal union experiences if you have them. Just, I guess, make sure they're not positive ones. Eight, make sure that employees understand that no union can guarantee anything. They can make empty promises, however. Oh my God. I hate the person who wrote this. No union can obtain more than the employer is willing or able to give. Yeah, but the employee is able to put that employer under extraordinary pressure, which increases what that employer is willing and able to give. And stats show, history shows, time and again, that happens more often than not. So fuck Ann Kubek. Fuck you. Nine. Compare our wages and benefits to other unionized or non-unionized companies to show how we compare favorably. Comment, but do you compare favorably to unionized companies? This actually raises another issue, which is the more or the greater the percentage of the private sector that is unionized, the more pressure there is on the non-unionized companies to have to be competitive with them. So in this case... Having unions in the economy is good even for people who aren't directly members. Their company hasn't been unionized yet, for example. It's good for everyone because it lifts the wage base for the entire industry. Okay. 10. Clarify any incorrect, untrue, or misleading statements made by union organizers. Give employees the correct facts. Okay. 11. Distribute information about unions in general or the facts about the specific union you may be dealing with. 12. Reply to union attacks on company policies, procedures, or benefits. 13. Advise employees of their legal rights so long as you do not encourage or finance an employee suit or legal action. 14. Insist that any solicitation of membership by either employees or outside organizers, be conducted outside of working time, i.e. when they are on break or off the clock. Keep union organizers who are not Borders employees out of backroom areas. 15. Treat union and non-union employees alike. 16. Tell employees that they are free to join or not join the union 
so far as their status with Borders is concerned. What should managers not do? And commenting quickly, this what should managers do and not do list, they don't really come from Borders themselves. They're coming from Borders' legal department who know the labor laws and then just basically tell Borders, look, you don't want a union. Here's everything that you can do. Do it to the fullest of your capacity. And here's everything that can get you in trouble. Don't do that. And, you know, so in other words, the corporation is very much aware of all the rules and all the boundaries. They're going to try to exploit every liberty that they have in favor of preventing employees from gaining more power. That's their objective. They may not say it in quite, you know, those terms, but that is what they're trying to do. And they will do it, believe me. So what should managers not do? One, attend union meetings or engage in any undercover activity, which implies surveillance of employee union activity. Two, terminate or discipline employees for engaging in union activity. Comment, by the way, even though this is what they should not do and what's illegal, and that's mostly the reason that they're saying they should not do it, is that it is illegal. This stuff happens all the time anyway, particularly terminating employees for engaging in union activity. Oftentimes they will do this and then just say it was for cause, but they will in fact be lying. And there have been many cases where even the conservative-oriented NLRB can't deny that that's what happened, and then they award, you know, they order the company to pay back pay to the fired employee. So it does happen all the time. Three, ask employees about union matters, meetings, etc. Ask employees about their opinions of the union or union organizers. You may listen if they choose to tell you, but you cannot ask. Four, ask employees how they intend to vote. Ask employees' opinions on how they think other employees may vote. Five, give financial support to a union or to employees, regardless of their union sympathies. Six, announce that Borders, Inc. will not deal with a union. Comment, this goes back to engaging in good faith negotiation. This is basically threatening not to do that. Seven, ask an employee during an interview about his or her affiliation with a labor organization. Eight, discriminate against pro-union employees when disciplining, assigning schedules or sections, etc. Nine, treat union and non-union employees differently over the same issue. Ten, deviate from borders policies for the purpose of getting rid of a pro-union person. Comment, so like I said, that happens all the time in practice. Also, corporate is able to cover their ass here by putting this down in writing. It's like, oh, well, we formally directed them not to. 11. Threaten a union member through a third party. 12. Make statements to employees that unionization will force borders to lay off employees, take away benefits, or close a store. 13. Start a petition against the union or encourage participation in such a petition if started by employees. 14. Visit the homes of employees to urge them to reject the union. Points of discussion. Here are some topics which may be useful to bring up when talking about unions with employees. Collective bargaining. You can explain to employees that collective bargaining is a process of negotiation, a process of give and take. You may point out that through the normal give and take of negotiation, employees may see improvements to their existing benefits. They may see a reduction in benefits, or they may find that no change is negotiated. However, telling an employee that they will, quote, start from scratch during negotiations can be seen as a threat. Competitive conditions. You can explain that the company will not commit economic suicide in contract negotiations. Comment. So, <laughs> letting employees keep more of the value of their labor translates to committing economic suicide. Very interesting. And I got another comment after this next line. You can explain the economic realities of retail and discuss salient points of our business. What's the comment there? The economic realities of retail. So, to give a little credit to any individual corporation, yes, this system is cutthroat, ruthless. Every corporation has to be shitty to its employees, not just because like they're all bad people, 
though many of them are. I submit you have to basically be a psychopath to want to be at the top of the system, honestly. But they have to engage in this type of behavior or else what? They will go out of business because somebody else will do it instead and then put them out of business. They will be outcompeted. I like to say that the profit motive is also the profit mandate. It's also legally mandated uh, for a shareholder protection that a corporation has to provide maximal you know, profit to the shareholders um, and that they can't really prioritize other things. But so let's take these two together. You can explain that the company will not commit economic suicide in contract negotiations. You can explain that I, just amazingly charged language there. You can explain the economic realities of retail and discuss salient points of our business. So, yes, it's true. Um, to an extent, you really can't change this system on an enterprise-by-enterprise -enterprise basis because any enterprise, whether it's Borders or you know any other company that is one of, well, was one of their competitors, they're playing by the same rules. I mean, they're playing on the same battlefield. This is a major problem with capitalism is the amount of like redundancy and waste. But what it comes down to is they can't lose a certain amount of profitability. It's not just an idealistic question of like how much is enough. While that's a very real question, it's a question for the system as a whole. Now, I contend that every corporation playing in the system has engaged in a ton of shitty behavior. Until we change the system, though, you're not going to really get any other result because that is the system as a whole. It's not down to just one company. The only solution is organizing on a class basis for confrontation with capital as a system, you know, as capitalism and changing that system because this is all the system can produce. Now, labor unions are are a basis for organizing on a class basis. Absolutely. We should engage in this. And we should bring every pressure that we can to bear on corporations within the system. Because it is applying this pressure across the board to many large enterprises at once. That is one way of articulating these issues and getting some pressure on the system to change, showing that we are organized as a class, we're making class demands. So in other words, doing very much what's happening within an institution with a labor union, but on an economy-wide basis. In fact, this is very much what the IWW, the one big union, was founded to do. It was founded to change the entire system, not just create a labor aristocracy of well-paid, you know, chosen few teachers, pet workers. So Borders is correct that there are, uh, you know, there was a very competitive reality that they were facing. You can see they're not in business anymore. But trying to put that on workers is fucking absurd. The fact is, how many capitalists do you see trying to change the system? No, they're all reaching for more. I mean, they have to reach for more because of the system, but they're also not trying to change that fact. We are. We are socialists. We are trying to change the system. They, on the whole, benefit more than they suffer from the system. It gives them the possibility of playing on that level, of competing for that profit. And by and large, they make out okay. We do not. We are the human resources. And we want to end the system. And if you want to end the system, we have to organize for it. You cannot wait for capitalists to try to change this system for us. They simply won't, even if some of them complain about some aspects of it. Okay, back to the text. You can point out that as a book and music retailer, we have limits to what we can afford to negotiate with a union. We sell a product with a clearly labeled suggested retail price, books which have suggested prices labeled on them, and an intensely competitively priced product, music, which our competitors often price well below our price, sometimes at cost. In most cases, our competitors sell the same items for less than we do already. 
We cannot up price books in order to pass the costs of increased benefits or wages for employees onto the customers. Now, what a weird thing here. Um, your company has profits, right? So what employees are actually asking for is that more of those profits be diverted to them, that they keep more of the value of their labor. You know, the services that they produce selling books in your store, they actually want the benefits of that. Um, whereas you are playing a tug of war with them to pay it to capitalists. That's not your employee's problem. And again here, as always happens, the capitalist pretends that they are somehow necessary, that those profits need to go to that capitalist rather than being you know, paid out to employees. And you know, of course, some is held on to pay for overhead and for you know, investment and things like that. But as this memo was so quick to point out earlier, this isn't a co-op. It's not a democracy. Literally, you're asking employees to care about things that they just have no stake in. It's not in their interest to care about that stuff. So this is, again, the sort of narcissism of capitalists. They really think everything revolves around them. Again, organizing on a class basis to oppose this is the, the only real solution. We need to end the system. It produces essentially psychotic behavior by this tiny minority of industry controllers. Continuing, dues. Although unions often waive initiation fees in the initial stages of a new union contract, dues can be hefty, up to $22 a month or more. Okay, comment, up to and or more sort of like negate each other, but anyway, and can go up if raises are negotiated through a contract. Okay, <laughs> but that benefits the employee. Continuing, typically unions attempt to negotiate a dues checkoff system where dues, initiation fees and assessments and fines are automatically removed from an employee's paycheck by the employer and sent to the union. Comment, point of fact, they talked about the IWW as one of, I think only two unions, was it? UFCW and the IWW in here. Uh, the IWW does not have a dues checkoff system. So anyway, disingenuous. Um, but again, we talked about this already. Dues can be hefty. Wow, up to $22 a month. How would you ever afford that? That's like, you know, what, two, maybe three hours if you're getting paid shit? And think of all the benefits you get. And that's a month. So you work for two, maybe three hours a month to get representation, which is, anyway, it's, it's absurd. Existing benefits. You can discuss current benefits and point out differences between current plans at Borders versus other negotiated union contracts or other book and music retailers. You can point out the economic value of our benefits. Comment. So, actually, the benefits was one of the points of contention in the case study above, but whatever. Fines. Unions can impose fines on members for a variety of reasons, usually outlined in their constitution, including not being present at union meetings, attempting to decertify the union, being disruptive at union meetings, refusing to honor a picket line, even for a strike at another business, filing an unfair labor charge against a union, etc. Union fines are legal debts collectible in court. So um, I can't speak to every one of these. There is one in particular I'm thinking but I would need to do a little more research on that. Anyway, again, they're preying on people's fear in this culture of collective action. That's really all it is, is that we are not used to standing up for each other, let alone having an obligation to stand up for each other, and they're trying to use that as a scare tactic. Grievance rights. Unions promise a formal grievance procedure which often appeals to employees. You should point out that Borders has always been an open-door policy company. Wow, dismissive wanking gesture. Give me a break. And encourage employees to recognize the value inherent in a policy that allows them to raise issues directly with their... Oh, my God. Here at Borders, we give you the freedom to be ignored directly by your manager. Okay. Allows them to raise issues directly with their manager, general manager, regional director, employee relations representative, any vice president, or the president of the company. Comment who will ignore you or maybe reprimand you. If you have a union, it's not one-on-one. -on -one, it's 
several fingers pulled together to form a fist. It's more power. Why anyone would think that that is a positive, I'm not really sure. I'm sure someone does. Guaranteed wage increases and benefits. Unions can promise wage increases or specific improvements to benefits. However, these promises cannot be guaranteed. Managers should point out Borders' consistent history on wages and solid benefits plans. For instance, over the last three years, Borders has regularly given out 4.5% annual average raises. Last year, first-time union-negotiated contracts averaged a 3% raise. The national average raise last year was 2.9%. The point is that there is no guarantee. Collective bargaining is unpredictable. Encourage employees to ask union representatives for a signed, notarized, legally enforceable guarantee of their promises. The union won't and can't do it. Now, I don't know what every union does in this case, but as I mentioned before, a general rule is that unions want participation, trust, and strong relationships with their member workers. If I was a union representative and the, you know, an employee who had been told by their manager exactly that thing to ask for a sign notarized legally enforceable, I would take that opportunity to explain to them how collective bargaining works, the importance of their participation, how the more employees get involved, the more likely they're to get anything, that ultimately it's the employer that's withholding all of the things that they want, etc. It's kind of an absurd request that, I mean, really is a, is a weakness of this document because they are encouraging workers to engage with the union, which probably is only going to help the union. Oh, well. Moving on, the nothing to lose mentality. Union supporters will often tell their coworkers that they have nothing to lose by voting in a union. This is false. Every wage provision and benefit is subject to change through the process of collective bargaining and could possibly be reduced as a result of negotiations. I'm making the what face. Like, what? what? People don't generally lose good conditions by joining unions. That's, I can't even imagine why they would put that in writing. Okay. Additionally, employees would possibly give up direct interaction with their managers. Oh no. I'm so sad. Imagine not having to interact directly with your manager and be forced to take their grievances to a shop steward, someone they may not know, like, or trust, but I'm sure they like, know, and trust their manager, to represent them to management. Literally, that is the whole idea. Seniority rules. Unions often argue that length of service should entitle individuals to receive promotions. It is important to point out that we have historically tried to hire the best and most capable individuals for jobs, rather than relying solely on length of service as a determining factor. When you have a lot of newer employees who hope to move up, seniority is often seen as an impediment to their ability to advance quickly within the company. Comment, on the other hand, there's also a future guaranteed to you. So there is that. You know, Borders acts like the only reason somebody gets a job is for, like, side money. We're literally relying on these wages for our life, for food, housing, clothing, water, like you name it. <laughs> uh, you cannot survive without this money. It is not a fringe benefit. Astoundingly out of touch. Strikes. You can discuss the possibility of strikes occurring, and that a strike is the union's chief means of pressure on an employer during collective bargaining. Comment. That is not true. There are many job actions short of a walkout that can be used and are used. So that is misleading. You can also point out that strikes may entail certain consequences for employees. Comment such as, However, we do not want to lead employees to believe that a strike is an inevitable result of unionization. Factual discussion of strikes is lawful, but we don't want to cause employees to take our discussions as threatening. Well, um, they're at a minimum manipulative. Moving on. Written contract. A major selling point for unions is the promise of the security of a written contract for employees. This has been particularly true in our company due to the at-will statement in our handbook. 
Our clear statement of being an at-will employer is a legal definition which distinguishes us from being a contractual employer. It does not dictate our behavior on how we deal with our employees, however. We have a clearly defined progressive discipline process and ask all managers to contact human resources prior to separating an employee. We do not fire employees without cause. A contract will not protect underperformers, however. Well, I mean, it depends underperforming on what and what does the contract say. You don't have the contract, so you don't know what it'll protect. Um, The amount of bullshit that they're piling up here is pretty astounding. This is what they tell their managers, though. So, anyway, union demand for recognition. Union representatives may approach a manager and tell him or her that they represent a majority of the employees. They may request that the employer recognize the union and offer to prove majority authorization by a card check. Managers should decline to allow this to happen as the NLRB may order the company to recognize the union and bargain with them without an election. This thing is kind of repetitive. Unions often contact employers demanding recognition without an election. This happened in all three union drives we have gone through thus far. Yeah, you know why? Because you got 70% of your employees signing A cards. We have declined recognition because we want our employees to have the opportunity to decide in a secret ballot election. Well, they signed the fucking A cards. We also want an opportunity to present our views on unions and borders. You want six weeks to torment them. That's what you want. A union will then file a petition. Filing of a petition, determining representation. Unions must have signed authorization cards from at least 30% of the eligible staff in order to file a petition. They typically don't file unless they have 50, 60, or 70%, however. Filing a petition will result in the NLRB contacting the employer to inform them that an election will be held, usually six to eight weeks after the petition is filed. Once we receive notice of a petition being filed, we inform our employees of that fact. The NLRB will ask both parties to come to an agreement on the voting unit, definition of supervisory status, and voter eligibility, as well as an agreement on the date of election. We typically seek to have the election held as late as possible to allow sufficient time to meet with the employees and share information with them, share information with them, which will help them make an informed decision. Typically, the union has been making its sales pitch for weeks or even months to the employees. A voting unit, and, you know, of course, Borders never gets a chance to influence employees ever, right? Right? A voting unit is the group of employees eligible to vote in the election. In each case, the union and the company attempt to come to an agreement on the voting unit. If they disagree, there would be an NLRB hearing to determine the voting unit. The voting unit was defined in both Philadelphia and Ann Arbor as all the employees who were on the payroll when the petition was filed, except for the general manager and assistant managers, i.e. including back office employees and the CRC. There is a potential debate over inclusion of part-time employees. They have been included in the voting unit in the first two union elections, and contingent employees, ditto. Supervisors are excluded from the voting unit. In our first two elections, the only people defined as supervisors have been the general and assistant managers. The NLRA defines a supervisor as, quote, any individual having authority in the interest of the employer to hire, transfer, suspend, lay off, recall, promote, discharge, assign, reward, or discipline other employees, or responsibly to direct them, or to adjust their grievances, or effectively to recommend such action if in connection with the foregoing, the exercise of such authority is not of a merely routine or clerical nature but requires the use of independent judgment, unquote. Once the voting unit has been defined, the employer must turn over to the board a list of employees' names and addresses, known as the Excelsior list. The NLRB then makes this information available to the union, which in turn can then visit employees at home, which managers cannot do, or send them information at home. Election. At least 30% of the employees in an appropriate unit must have signed authorization cards to the union in order for the NLRB to authorize an election. An employee who signs a union card is not required to vote for the union in the election. He or she can change his or her mind for any reason. Employees who do not sign cards are still eligible to vote if they are in the voting unit, regardless of the fact that they did not sign a union card. Elections are held by secret ballot, 
and no one will ever know how anyone voted, unless there is a unanimous vote, of course. Elections are typically held in the store, in an area convenient to employees, but not in a supervisor's office. In order to be eligible to vote, employees must be employed in the voting unit during the payroll period ending immediately prior to the NLRB approval of the election agreement and must be employed on the date of the election. Employees on leave are eligible to vote. There are no absentee ballots, however. To win an election, the union would need to garner 50% plus one of the votes cast. For example, there were 71 eligible voters in store number one. If everyone voted, 36 votes would win the election for either side. However, if only 34 employees chose to vote, then 18 votes would win the election. Regardless of how many employees vote, all employees in the bargaining unit or in a position covered by the bargaining unit agreement would be represented by the union if the union were to win the election. We strongly encourage all eligible employees to vote in the election, regardless of whether they support the union or not. Since all members of the bargaining unit will be affected if a union is voted in, it is important that each employee have a voice in the election process. Not voting tends to benefit the union, because then they need fewer votes to win. Votes are tallied after the election process, and the elections are made known immediately pending any challenges from either side. Bargaining orders without election. Under certain circumstances, a company can be ordered to bargain with a union which has obtained authorization cards from a majority of its employees, even without a secret ballot election. This is usually only true when a company commits numerous serious unfair labor practices or if they recognize the union by accepting cards. Post-election decertification. Regardless of the outcome of the election, we must strive to keep our communications open and to continue to run our business in a fair, ethical, and responsible manner. Whichever side loses the election is likely to feel disappointed, of course. Comment, of course, if it's management who loses, they have lots and lots of money to comfort them. It is important that managers maintain an above-board approach when discussing the union and the outcome of the election. If we win the election, we should not gloat, but should focus on moving forward together to resolve issues. We must be sure to keep our eyes focused on dealing with the types of issues raised during the election campaign. Regular communication must continue. Objections to the outcome of an election must be filed within seven days after the election. Objections can be raised on the conduct of the election or on conduct which affects the results of an election. If no objections are raised, the NLRB will certify the election and send both parties confirmation of the election results. The National Labor Relations Act allows employees the right to decertify their union through an election process similar to that which allowed the union into the workplace. The union must receive a majority of votes cast in order to retain certification. A tie results in decertification. A decertification petition must be filed by the employees, not the management, and must be supported by at least 30% of the employees. Managers may not initiate or assist in the preparation of the petition. They may, however, provide employees with the address of the NLRB if they request advice on how to decertify the union. A decertification petition can be filed one year after an election which certifies a union if a contract has not been negotiated. Between the 90th and 60th day prior to the expiration of an existing contract, after a contract has expired, if it is not renewed or extended. Commenting, that's pretty much the end of the document. There are another couple of sections which are basically workshops of scenarios of you know, testing the manager's knowledge of whether they can or can't engage in particular behavior. If you want to check that out, there will be a link to the document I just read in the description. Um, otherwise, I just like to wrap up. I know this file has been really long and they actually repeated a couple sections in it. Um, basically, you can see that the NLRB process under existing labor law is very slanted towards the employers. It was set up in the 1930s because there were so many strikes that some capitalists were like, look, we've got to make this system run more smoothly. And honestly, some capitalists, by being very stubborn, were risking revolution by not recognizing unions and really escalating things. The NLRB was put into place to try to initiate a class peace, prevent things from escalating further, 
um, you know, allowing for some concessions and an orderly unionization process, which would be subject to law regulated by the capitalist courts, et cetera, et cetera. While it did lead to, you know, the social democracy, quote, class peace, ultimately you could say it just kind of prolonged the conflict between capital and labor. Of course, neoliberalism came in in the late 70s, 80s, and now we're 40 years into it. And um, they've just been repealing all of this stuff. It's harder than ever to form a union uh, because now it is very much regulated and uh, not regulated in a way that really benefits workers. There are still you know, some advantages that you can coax out of the system if you really know what you're doing. However, some unions, like the IWW mentioned in this article, are really shying away from the NLRB election process. I have mixed feelings on that. Uh, they're instead emphasizing what they call minority unionism, or also known as solidarity unionism, which is more like intended to get just a clique of people on the floor who are organized, cover for each other, um, you know, stand up as a group and that kind of thing. You can read more about that if you would like. Otherwise, I am going to leave it there for this file. And uh, let me know what you think. Have you been in a union? What have been your experiences? And uh, what kinds of content on this subject would you like to see in the future? Otherwise, we're going to thank our current patrons whose names are on the screen. Every contribution is very much appreciated. And we're happy to see several new patrons signing up this month. We've also got some new ones whose names will be on the May credits after they have been billed on May 1st. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to you for listening. Please remember to like, share, subscribe, and we will catch you in the next video.